All right, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to uh, Cultish entering the Kingdom of the Cults. We are now in. This is going to be part two of our introduct of our uh, sort of introductory episode into the world of Christian Science and Mary Baker Eddy. Andrew, was your mind blown once again in that previous <laughs> introductory episode with Tanner? Yeah, my mind is extremely blown right now because Christian Science is an extremely intricate philosophy and metaphysic. You know, and there's so much to it in order to even understand, you know, definitions and terminology uh, specifically that Christian scientists use. We know, we all know that they use the same words as Christians, that they use the word Jesus Christ and um, sin, but it means different things. And we're going to be getting into that today. And I'm really excited about that. Yeah. So Tanner, uh, just thank you again for coming on to have this discussion with us. And we thank you for reaching uh, out for reaching out to us. And I think it's going to be very helpful for those people who don't know anything about Christian science to kind of get an intro. This is going to be just an overview, kind of like a really good introductory primer. And we'll have more content for you guys on our social media, which will help you understand more about Christian science. So I want to just jump into some of the nitty gritty uh, theology, uh, Tanner. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to read... Uh, three different uh, quotations that Walter Martin uh, picked from his book, Kingdom of the Cults. And I'm just going to read them off, and then you can go ahead and just give us your commentary, and we'll just jump into the conversation. We'll kind of get into, uh, again, Walter Martin always talked about defining our terms. There's always a language barrier. So here we go. Uh, so in the section Kingdom of the Cults, Dr. Walter Martin, uh, in the, under the section under Christian Science and the Doctrine of the Trinity, and the deity of Christ. Uh, this is the first quote that says, the theory of three persons in one God, that is a personal tri uh, trinity or triunity, suggests polytheism rather than an ever present I am. That's from Science and Health, page 256. The second quote says, quote, the Christian, science, the Christian who believes in the first commandment is a monotheist. Thus, he virtually unites with the Jews' belief in one God and recognizes that Jesus Christ is not God as Jesus himself declared, but is the son of God. Close quote. That's from science and health page 361. And then what I find, this is a very interesting uh, quote too. And I'm sure you'll be able to expand uh, on this for us, Tanner, but this quote says, uh, the spiritual Christ was infallible. Jesus as material manhood was not Christ. Close quote. And that's from miscellaneous writings, page 84. What I find fascinating fascinating about the third quote is that when they refer to uh, Jesus being material manhood. So all that being said, with those three quotes on the nature of Jesus, kind of like what they believe, jump into just the terminology of what do they really believe about Jesus and how are the Gospels interpreted in, in light of science and health, the key of the scriptures? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> Big question. Yes. Um, <laughs> More so, yours. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, is, uh, it is the temptation um, for all of us to make God in our own image, um, to, um, to, to try to define God in such a way that, um, that, that we can understand him. And... Um, for Mary Baker Eddy and for Christian science, what we can understand of God um, is, uh, is, is the standard. Um, you know, the, the, the idea of the Trinity um, is, uh, it just makes no sense to a Christian scientist. It makes no sense to, uh, to Mary Baker Eddy. There, there, uh, time and again, she would mischaracterize Christian beliefs in the Trinity, talking about three persons in one person, mm -hmm. as opposed to three persons in one being. Um, she didn't understand the doctrine of the Trinity, and so she sets up straw men. Um, uh, and, you know, Christian scientists um, can kind of uh, uh, take pride in, uh, in, in having the true understanding of, of God that, um, that benighted Christians don't have. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, and people also have a tendency to make a Jesus in their own image. So Mary Baker Eddy's view of Jesus is as this really great man who is this amazing teacher and this amazing healer who was persecuted because he was teaching people how to heal. Um, 
He was persecuted because he was healing. Um, that's Mrs. Eddy's mythic self-conception. And so the Jesus that she speaks of throughout her writings is really just kind of a view of self. Um, so in Christian science, Jesus is a man, and Christ is the spiritual idea. Now, Christian science didn't invent that idea, trying to divide out the human and the divine yeah. in, 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 the, in the person of, of Jesus. I mean, that, you know, that goes back 2,000 years. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and, and the church, going on the basis of Scripture alone, has consistently found that Jesus is both human and divine, both God and man. Um, and, uh, uh, but Christian scientists are, are ignorant of church history. Um, uh, you know, they sort of have this view that, uh, that, uh, you know, the Bible has all of these, you know, great things about healing. Then they lost sight of, of, of true healing around the time of council of Nicaea. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and Mary Bickerty has restored it. Um, you know, so like the Mormons, this restorationist view. Yeah, and Charles Hayes Russell had that as well, too. There's always this falling away, this lost knowledge, but all of a sudden I have what everyone else lost. And um, right. one right. thing that I, I always find this fascinating as well, too, Andrew, is that I was in an online uh, discussion with, a, uh, with someone who is a cultist, and they were attacking the doctrine of the Trinity one of the things I've always noticed, and this is probably, and I've seen this with, with just with your mentioning, is that it always seems that it's a doctrine that you can't attack without misrepresenting. Mm. I had someone who was trying yeah. to argue that, you know, it was invented at Nicaea and it was invented by, like, the word Trinity is not found in the Bible. And we need to, and it was invented by the creeds and all that stuff. And I was just saying, can, can, we, can, we, get, can we talk about what, it, what does the Bible actually say? Like that's can we actually talk about that? And it seems like they are constantly avoiding trying to get away from that. Because and I think one of the problems too is that with occultists, they always try and start with their worldview. And I would you we mentioned earlier in the passage in Genesis how Mary Baker Eddy just says that's wrong. It's not necessarily wrong because she's a Bible scholar expert, it because that doesn't coincide with her view that Adam was a physical fleshly being that God breathe life in too. So I, I just find that fascinating as well. But uh, go ahead and continue, uh, Nathan, with what you're saying. Well, so, um, so she separates out Jesus from the Christ. And mm-hmm. um, the Christ is, is this divine message um, from God to man, speaking to the human consciousness, those are her words. Um, basically, but revealing to us our innate true spiritual perfection as found in Genesis one in, in, in her view of Genesis one. Um, and, uh, Mary Baker Eddy, um, said this in her own published writings in, uh, miscellany page three eighteen. Um, <clears throat> she says, uh, she was speaking to, um, one of the editors of science and health who, um, who cleaned up a lot of the language um, and got rid of a lot of sort of the I am God type stuff or we can be God type stuff. He was, he was an agnostic Unitarian uh, uh, minister. And, um, and he was coming to her with all sorts of doubts as to whether Jesus actually existed. And she said, and she wrote this in her writings, I do not find my authority for Christian science in history but in revelation, <laughs> if there had never existed such a person as the Galilean prophet, it would make no difference to me. Wow. And it, it did make no difference to her, unfortunately for her. Um, and for hundreds of thousands of Christian scientists, um, for, for her, uh, his teachings about healing, you know, that's what's important. And, you know, again, Jesus didn't teach about healing. Um, um, but that's the view because it's, it, it's essentially her 
um, and her, her mythic self-conception, um, <laughs> renamed Jesus, um, that that's, that is the view of Jesus. And, um, so Jesus was just this good man, wasn't God, who was doing all these healings. And if we have the true spiritual understanding, and he never gave medicine to people, so we, sh- we wouldn't give medicine to people. Mm. Um, God is spirit. God is mind. God is, God is not material. And so we wouldn't use material methods or material remedies in order to heal. Um, that's, that is um, a pretty integral part of, of Christian science. And that's what most people know Christian science for, is, is for not using medicine. But it really comes out of this, this false Christ. Man, that is such a good point. I'm so glad, Tanner, that you brought that up because we've said before, bad theology hurts people. And this is why this is something so prominent to discuss. You know, you have friends who are ex-cultists um, or specifically ex-Christian scientists who, who, who came out of this. And, and a lot of times ex-cultists, they come out of, they go into atheism or agnosticism. And I think this is also too why certain people who are cult experts like Steve Hassan or uh, or other prominent experts, they fall short because they don't have the ultimate standard of truth to adhere to. Because unless you actually begin with God and his word and the foundation and the real, the real authentic historical <laughs> that Jesus Christ that matters, uh, because God is the God of history that came in, that came into history uh, outside of it. But you have to, that's the only way in which you can have a definitive standard in which to judge by what is a cult and what is, and what is not. And uh, Andrew, talk about what you were talking about in, right before we started recording this about, about that as well, too. Yeah, so, so where I'm thinking right now, it's like in, in, in Christian science, what exactly did Christ accomplish? Jesus Christ, my, may I say, like in his humanity. So in Orthodox Christianity, he took on flesh for a reason to become an efficacious sacrifice, a sacrifice for our sins so that we can have peace with God. It was necessary and it was planned and it had a purpose. It had a reason. It brings all history to one point in time of a a, a loving God who is personal, a God who knows us to the, the tiniest atom, every fiber in our being, he knows and upholds it with the word of his power humbles himself, becomes a man and dies for us so that we can have peace with God so that we can understand. So that's, that's the Jesus of scripture where all of the Bible revol- revolves around him. But in Christian science, the, the Jesus of Christian science was one that performed miracles, one whose blood had no efficacious purpose, one who really was just connected to this divine mind who said, this is how you are. You were once perfect. Like there's, I believe there is a, a quote from Mary Baker, Baker Eddy. It says, you know, so is man perfect? Yes. In light of Christ, man is seen as he actually is. So to them, uh, Christ really, what he did was show us that you can break the bonds of this illusion and you can become one with this divine mind essentially, because that's what you are. But that's, that, that's a suppression of everything that we're told in scripture about our fallen state as people who are at war with God, who are at spiritual enmity with God. And that's, and there's, there's repercussions of denying that a suppression of the truth, a suppression of suffering, a suppression of all things in this world to then say, you can speak your own things into existence to deny our physical bodies and this physical reality there, there, it comes with consequences. So, for example, with the Jehovah's Witnesses, we have the organization who's interpreting the Bible for these people, and it says you can't have blood transfusions. Yep. And now in 2016, we had around 1,200 deaths that occurred because they denied blood transfusions. In the Orthodox Christian worldview, it's like, look at these medical advancements. God allowed this to happen. It's a grace, a common grace that we have. Mm-hmm. But in, in when you follow a false Christ and we have a standard that is contrary to scripture, there's going to be death. It's inevitable. Those who hate God and who, who do not love God, they love death. And that's, that's what they're after. 
So there's a spirit behind all of this, behind all of this worldview. And we can see that a, a Christ that did not truly exist, one which would be the Christ of Christian science, it, it, it comes with death and it comes with blood. We don't want to be um, characters caricature we don't want to caricature or walk around that or dance around that there's a real situation here there's people that are suffering who don't understand their suffering who can't see god's sovereignty because they are being told essentially that they are god and that's that's a very terrifying thing and that's that's <clears throat> something that's on my heart right now it's just <laughs> i'm just burning yeah. with that Tan- no, yeah. tanner what do you think about that brother what do you think about that yeah you know it's six months before my conversion um you know, my wife and I both said that we would rather die than go to a doctor. Mm. Um, um, you know, you, you, you're being told to choose between what they call materia medica, between medicine and your gut and God. Um, well, you know, who's going to choose that? Um, mm. And so uh, they're just... Um, they're just story after story after story... Of just so many people I, I love, so many people I know, you know, whose parents died when they were teenagers, um, uh, you know, whose husbands died when they're, you know, 24, um, whose kids died. Um, yeah, bad theology kills. Mm. And um, um, yeah, there's so many stories that I wish I could tell, but they aren't mine to tell. Um, mm. But, um, you know, when um, in, in 1989, um, I'll tell this, this was out in the uh, papers, there was, a, there was a measles outbreak. Um, at Principia College, and Principia College is a college for Christian scientists um, here in the St. Louis area, and um, out of a community of about 900, um, over 160 members of the community uh, came down with the measles, and three of the three of those kids died um, of of the measles. I contracted measles from that outbreak, actually. Wow. Um, um, but, uh, but I didn't die. Um, there, um, uh, there are, uh, websites out there which deal with, um, with the deaths of, of, of children, um, in Christ, under Christian science care and, uh, Christian science parents have been, um, taken to court for manslaughter, uh, in uh in in several instances um and these people love these people love their kids let me just let me just say that yeah. first and foremost they love their kids they think what they're doing is the best thing for their kids hmm. um they're just horribly deceived mm-hmm. um and um the um <clears throat> the effects of this, um, you see it on, on kids. You also see it on parents, um, where, uh, so many of my friends in college, uh, you know, they had one or both of their parents die when they were in college. Um, mm. I, um, I was talking to a friend a couple years ago and, and, um, we estimated, um, over half, if not three quarters of, of the people from our graduating class, um, uh, had lost one or more parents. Um, you yeah, know, so it, it, I mean, it just, you know, I, I never knew my grandmother <laughs> growing yeah. up. Um, a, 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 um, Someone I love very much, um, her mother uh, died on the day of her older sister's college graduation. Um, and it's just, okay, you know, that's, right. <laughs> that's the way it happens. And in Christian science, you, um, 
you're taught to suppress emotions, not to feel feel any negative emotions. So you wouldn't feel uh, grief. Um, yeah, you're told not to grieve. And people, all your friends are dying. Just your people in your community are dying all around you and like prematurely just because of the fact they're not getting this medical treatment, which is something that God, like really you think about all the, you look at the progression of Christianity, like throughout the world, Christians are the ones who were advancing. Like look at the Red Cross, the whole story behind like the Red Cross being founded and like all the hospitals that Christians have done. Like you think about like, the mercy ships where they go to these pl these places in, in other countries and they're helping just by the, yeah. just by tons of, just tons of people who are like with cle with the cleft lips and all those different aspects of like how they help people. And like, you just, it's so prominent. This is basic Christianity. Like you look at that. What, what I'm yeah, just, look, go yeah. ahead, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, look, two years before I, I became a Christian, I gave a talk at that college about how, uh, about how using, I using medicine went against the Bible and, um, and we needed to, uh, you know, hold, hold the line on that. And, um, um, yeah, anyway, <laughs> for no, no, standing it, ovation. It, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, I just think about this too. I and mean, you think of like all the pre, all the people who have died statistically just with Jehovah's witnesses, but now how much more exemplified it is or magnified by in, in Christian science because now it is no medical treatment whatsoever and we look at a, a horrific event like the Jonestown mass suicide which was in our premiere episode ground zero Jonestown where we went over the the Jonestown death tape and everyone looks at that at how horrific and it was horrific but it just so happened to be right around a thousand people in one particular place at one particular time but now you just see just gradually just people who are who are dying prematurely and because they're not getting the medical treatment because of these teachings and they believe in a sense i'm assuming they believe in a sense that they're just if they died it's because they they almost in a sense died as martyrs because they're dry, they're trying to they were being faithful for the teachings of, of mary, mary baker entering christian science what i'm just curious about too is um now I'll let you jump in too as well too, Andrew. Is obviously from medical science has has evolved tremendously since the early 1800s. You know, you look at what people believed about. You know, the you, you think about like in the Civil War and like the amputations and how brutal that was. You know, and just and how things were in the 1800s. But this is the advancement of of surgery and the and and the, all the you still like different vaccines that have happened that have uh, stop different uh, plagues and stuff like that and just just going through the where technology is now as far as like medical science goes it's evolved tremendously has there because uh, has there been more of a, of a rising tension between the teachings of christian science and where she was i mean i don't know if mary big or eddie like it foresaw the medical technology getting to where it is today has there been like a rising tension between those in a sense like there's would there be a, a a clash of worldviews there, just as far as the medical community, the evolving medical community in Christian science. Oh sure, yeah, there are huge cla um, clashes there, and and you know Mary Baker Eddy says that like a, the uh, you know the medical profession is the cause of sickness. You know, it's their wrong thoughts of of man as material is is the cause of sickness. Mm. Um, so yeah, huge huge clashes of worldview there. Um, <laughs> Funny thing is, I've I've talked to Christian Scientists because Christian Science culture is changing slightly. It's becoming slightly more accepting of, of medicine, mm. a little bit a little bit kind of like behind the scenes, undercover. Um, that's part of why I was asked to give that talk at the college um, to try <laughs> to stem that tide. Um, and um, um, you know, I've I've talked to to Christian Scientists who say, well, if Mary Baker had lived today, she would approve of using medicine. No, she wouldn't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, she wouldn't. And she said again and again uh, throughout her writings, um, and spoke about the evils of, of medicine. Um, you know, again, the, her, um, but, but for Christian scientists, yeah, her worldview is determinative. 
and Christian science can't be wrong. So Christian scientists will even come up with different versions of Christian science in order to reconcile it to what they're comfortable with. Wow. Um, while, while still staying in Christian science. Um, yeah, and, and, and there, there are so many Christian scientists I know who feel so, so guilty because um, so many of them feel horribly guilty because they're using medicine. Um, and um, yeah, because they're following a, a, a false Christ, a false gospel. One thing I, I want to point out is that these people, you know, that are following this false belief, they are victims. They are victims of the teachings of Mary Becker Eddy and a false Christ. And we got to understand that every single religious system, any cult that is not part of the Bible, all of it is going to require a sacrifice. So yeah. if you do not believe in the eternal God who took on flesh, who died for your sins, you are going to end up to try to be that sacrifice to appease God. And it will not work. Every system of thought that ever existed, it all requires a sacrifice. It's either going to be yourself, which is nothing but filthy rags to God, mm. or you're going to accept, humbly accept that God died for you. And that, that's where it ends up. We've got the Mormons sacrificing their time, sacrificing all of these things for these works and going on a mission here or going there to try to appease God with their, their works, essentially. You know, mm -hmm. while denying the fact that the eternal God who created them and created all things came into existence and died for them. So they're yeah. sacrificing themselves, mm. you know, and it's, it's very similar. I, I'm, I'm finding with this with the Christian scientists is that we have this access to the grace that God gave us, this common grace of medicine. And instead of taking that, they say, no, I'm going to sacrifice myself. And it's, and it's sad. They're victims. It's almost like a Stockholm syndrome. You know, you're stuck in this cycle. You're stuck in this circle, but it's not, it's not, it's not helping. And that, that's what Christians now need to realize. We need to realize that we are children of the true living God, that he has power, that he exists and sits at the right hand of the father and is reigning now. Only he can bring about freedom. Right. And that's by preaching the gospel. Yeah. That, that's what we need to understand to go out there and we need to talk to these people. They are victims. They're hurting. They're dying. They're trying to sacrifice themselves instead of relying on the sacrifice of Christ. Mm -hmm. And that is a, a terrifying thing to think about. Absolutely. So yeah. Tanner, uh, I'll, I'm going to just uh, hand it back to you here. So I mean, you talked about just your time uh, being in there and just seeing, and I, and again, I just really appreciate your vulnerability and transparency. I mean, I, I just, yes, it's just, the ability to see that all around you, but then having to suppress your emotions about that. Let me ask you this as well, too. And I talked about this to you when I was initially on the phone with you. In the aspect of uh, mental health, that's always been a key factor of people who are in the cults and also coming out of the cults, that there's always a lot of, I mean, it's, it's so predominant, especially in, the, in with ex Jehovah's Witnesses in our last uh, series that we did. But in the same way, you talked about how they viewed in the same way, like a doctor, like uh, medicinal with someone like a licensed uh, psychologist or therapist to help with the areas of like mental health. That would be the case as well as well too, or talk about that as well too. Yeah. Just as a Christian scientist would never go to a doctor um, or, 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 or wouldn't, uh, you know, let it be known that they would, they would not go to, to a counselor or a, or a therapist or a you know, psychologist. Um, so the, the whole uh, realm of psychology, the whole realm of mental health is, um, is completely foreign <laughs> to, mm. uh, to Christian scientists. And, and um, you're told to suppress your emotions and, um, and, and you're living in a constant state of denial. Um, you know, I have friends who to this day have not seen a picture of anything from 9-11 because they don't want to make a reality of it. They're living mm. in denial that it happened. Wow. Uh, um, uh, you, you live in constant denial and, um, and also this constant thought that, uh, that you're responsible for things. So when 9-11 happened, I felt guilty. Because had I been on my game spiritually, I could have stopped it. 
So Mary Baker Eddy wrote to uh, the Christian scientists in, uh, in San Francisco after the 1906 earthquake that had they been doing their work spiritually, had they been on top of things spiritually, that earthquake wouldn't have happened. And you just think of the narcissism and the guilt, uh, which comes as a result of that, mm. um, where you are responsible for, uh, for the fate of the world, essentially. Um, one of my uh, reactions to 9-11 was guilt, uh, feeling that um, had I been on top of things metaphysically, had I, had I really been spiritually praying as I should, that 9-11 wouldn't have happened. Um, so Mary Baker Eddy would have been diagnosed with a severe case of narcissistic personality disorder. Um, she just checks every single box. Um, she checks boxes for most of the DSM um, uh, problems. But um, but uh, Christian science breeds so much narcissism, even though they don't use the language today that, that, uh, that we can become spirit, we can become God. Um, that is the mindset that uh, that I am responsible for sickness and for health, and I am responsible, um, f you know, for, for world of world affairs, hmm. and um, and and as as difficult as um, as the physical scars that we all bear from uh, from our time in Christian Science. Um, Without a doubt, um, the biggest scars that that ex Christian scientists talk about are the the emotional mm. and the psychological, um, the mental and, and and yes, the spiritual scars mm. um, from um, from having to suppress things for so long, for um, you know having parents those that that you are turning to for love and support, um, being emotionally distant, emotionally cut off, uh, that, that you can't come to them and say, hey, mom, I'm feeling sick. Um, um, I mean, you know, they respond the best that they, that they know, but, um, but their worldview just brings so much harm to, uh, to those family relationships. Well, and, uh, so, so it's almost yeah. an a, it's almost an aspect where like they're orphaned, even though even if there is like a mom and a dad there. Wow! Like there's there's real there's almost like spiritually induced fatherlessness. Hmm. Would that be a correct assessment? Yeah. <sighs> those are those are some strong words. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Mary Baker Eddy, um, she had a a, a child um, with her first husband, and um, and. She didn't care, take care of the child. Um, and the child was taken away from her. Um, and uh, Mary Baker Eddy's recounting of that is that there was this whole conspiracy to take her child away. That's not what the facts on the ground say. Yeah. Uh, um, and, um, you know, I, you know, I love my folks, you know, um, but yeah, there are a lot of people who feel hugely cut off from, um, emotionally cut off from their families, emotionally orphaned. Yeah. Mm. Wow. So let me ask you this. So this is, you've, we've covered a lot of ground here. Um, get into the point where, what gives the point that led up to your your conversion moment, like getting out of Christian Science? Because you mentioned we we talked a bit about like the the mental uh, the uh, medical aspects, both in regards to you know physically, but also like the mental health aspect for sure. And that's uh, that could be a whole other podcast in and of itself. But um, kind of if you could just walk us through what what kind of what were the the talk about what what happened in between the six months to where you said you and your wife said that you'd never go to a hospital. And then God, by God's grace, you became a new creation. And the Bible talks about that. Talk to us about, you know, lead, lead us into that as well. 
So, uh, so I've got to, I've got to back up way before six months. Um, yeah, man. So <laughs> timeline's yours. <laughs> so, so as as I said, um, when I was in college, I had Christian Science class instruction, which is training to become a practitioner, and I became um, one of the youngest uh, practitioners in Christian Science history. Um, and uh, during that training. Um, my Christian science teacher and those Christian science teachers, they all operate as cults within the cult. Um, uh, this is a man who was like a father figure for me. Um, and he loved the Bible as he understood it. He had over a hundred thousand pages of notes on, on the first chapter of Genesis. Um, he encouraged me to, to study Greek um, in college, um, and to do word studies in, in, in Greek and in Hebrew. Um, and, um, he wholeheartedly believed that Mary Baker Eddy fulfills a number of, of, uh, biblical prophecies, hundreds of biblical prophecies. And I knew those, those prophecies like the back of my hand. Mm. Um, and in, and, um, in order to better understand Mary Baker Eddy and better understand Christian science fulfillment of prophecy, I began to study Jesus fulfillment of prophecy. Mm-hmm. I began to um, listen to people online talking about uh, Jesus fulfilling prophecy. I began to listen to um, uh, and 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 read things uh, uh, from a Christian perspective um, about. Um, about the Bible, hmm. and uh, and also another thing that that um, my teacher uh, pointed out is that uh, that teaching is based on a question and answer system that that um, sort of derived is a, is a horrible perversion <laughs> of the Westminster Catechism, hmm. which um, Mary Baker Eddy claims to have memorized as a girl. <laughs> and so uh, I thought, okay, well, that's the basis. And she grew up a Calvinist. Um, so I'm, I'm going to start, you know, learning some of that stuff. And so I started reading Westminster Catechism. Um, and, um, and I started, it, Mary Baker has throwaway lines throughout her, her writings where she will um, have, have a sentence taken out of context from Luther and Augustine and Jonathan Edwards and I took those as endorsement. I took those as, okay, here she is citing, citing these, these people. Yeah, they don't have all the answers, but they've got a lot of great answers, enough for her to, to positively cite them. Mm-hmm. So I started reading um, in college. I started reading um, things from Luther and from Calvin and, and Augustine and, um, and Jonathan Edwards and Irenaeus. Um, so after college, um, um, about a year later, I moved out to Boston, which is where the world headquarters of the church is. And I, um, I lived across the street there for, um, for many years, lived in Boston for, for nine years, uh, attending six services a week, um, ushering them. I was head usher, platform usher, assistant superintendent, taught uh, Sunday school to every age range. And I was giving talks um, to different places around the country about Christian science. And at first, my talks on Christian science were about Mary Baker Eddy fulfilling prophecy and, you know, within the Christian science worldview. But more and more, my talks um, uh, began to shift. And and I found myself um, using kind of biblical um, basis, basis for things and, and cherry picking quotes from science and health to support what I was, what I was saying, um, which is the opposite of what Christian scientists do, where they start with Mary Baker Eddy and cherry pick the Bible. Um, in, in 2010, um, I watched a, 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 um, a talk by Tim Keller at, mm-hmm. uh, at the gospel coalition, uh, where he's talking about idolatry mm-hmm. and, that rocked my world. Mm. Um, I, uh, he was talking about the idols of our hearts and, and, and I, I could see there were just so many idols in my heart. 
but I didn't know how to get rid of them. Um, and I could tell he was talking to people who all kind of, a, you know, they knew what the solution was for getting rid of those idols. Um, but I, but I didn't, um, but that talk rocked my world. And, and I began to break free from some patterns of sin in my life that, that had had a real hold on me. Um, and I, um, my talks, the subject of my talk started to change to idolatry, um, our need of a savior, um, hmm. uh, grace and grace is a totally foreign concept. Right. Yeah. Um, after after that talk and here I, I'd been in Boston for almost 10 years um, I felt like God was telling me to move to North Carolina I didn't know why <laughs> but uh, but but felt like that um, uh, which got me out of Boston and and out of just being right there um, my wife has had the same Christian science teacher that I that I did. And, uh, when we first met, we met at, at a meeting of our, of our Christians as teacher in line for lunch. And, and we struck up a conversation. Um, and I, I, I sat at an empty, uh, table in the middle of the room, just kind of hoped she'd come over and, and, and sit with me. And she did. Um, and during that, right from that opening conversation, I'm talking with her about grace and she had never heard the idea. She, she says later that, uh, she thought the, the song Amazing Grace was about this great woman. Um, <laughs> and uh, um, so um, we, got, we got married a year later. And actually, um, uh, we chaperoned a trip for that school, um, Principia, um, to Israel. I'd been to Israel several times before. Um, but while we were there in Israel, uh, we were at the garden tomb, and somebody gave... Um, just a, a quick explanation of the gospel. Mm. That was the first time Hillary, I, and I'd been sharing gospel things with her, um, but that was the first time she heard it. And um, that really just meant so much to her and so much to me. I was like, okay, great. I can marry this woman. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, um, uh, she was living in St. Louis teaching at the school um, after our first child was born, she, um, uh, she quit and became a, a practitioner, became a healer too. And during this time I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sharing things with her about grace and, and she's loving it. Um, and, and just becomes on, on fire with, uh, with that message. And, um, and she kept coming to me and saying, you know, Tanner, if I were to write a book, it would be about the gospel. It wouldn't be about healing. Wow. Um, and um, for four years, I didn't have a single good night's sleep. I'm tossing and turning every night because here I am, a nationally, well, a pretty well-known Christian scientist, let's mm-hmm. put it that way. Yeah. And... Um, completely committed to Mary Baker Ready fulfilling biblical prophecy and I'm not seeing grace there. Mm. I'm not seeing the gospel. And um and and I never told my wife a single doubt or concern. Um uh but she's growing on, uh, in love uh, for the gospel. People are hearing about um talks that I'm, that I'm giving and wanting kind of previews of them. And so people were coming to our, to our house a couple nights a week, um, to hear the message of grace that we were talking about. Um, and, and I would cherry pick things out of Mary Baker Eddy's writings that made it, made her sound like a Calvinist. (laughs) (laughs) Um, and, um, and say, yeah, you know, Mary Baker, Mary Baker Eddy thought that, that, that I found a reference that said God in, in one of her earlier writings, but I didn't see the full context, but it says that we are too. Mm, um, yeah. So, um, so people are, are hearing about this. These are on fire. I'm, I'm, uh, um, filling in a little bit at, uh, as a Bible class, um, uh, 
you know, at the school teaching uh, things there. Um, and uh, I was coming up to the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. Mm. And every year I would write like a hundred, 150 page, sometimes 200 page paper on something pertaining to Christian science. And my, my thesis was that on all the issues that separated Rome from the reformers, um, looking basically at Luther, um, Christian science culture stands with Rome over against reformers. Wow. So justification, scripture alone, uh, superstition, <laughs> you know, all sorts of things, you know, 150 pages. I want to read that. <laughs> and, uh, um, and, and I was saying, you know, Christian science culture, I had had problems for 20 years with Christian science culture, but I thought we were just doing it wrong. And if we got back to mm, okay. seeing the study fulfilling biblical prophecy, which is a minority view within within Christian science, mm-hmm. um, that would fix everything. Yeah. But my my doubts were definitely growing. Um, so um, mid October 2017, my wife was asked to give a talk, a uh, chapel talk to uh, to the high school students and and um, uh, and the faculty staff at Principia on any topic she wanted and she chose grace and people came up, uh, people came up to her uh, afterwards and said that was the best talk I've ever heard. Um, it, you know, people are just hungering for this message. The mo- the number one question that I got as a Christian science practitioner was how can I know God loves me? <laughs> These people want to know the love of God. They are hungry. And they're thirsting and they want to know the real living God who knows them and loves them. This, this message speaks to them um, deep down to the core. Mm, wow. Um, so three weeks later, I'm lying in bed and I'm saying, Holy Spirit, you've got to do your work in us, whatever that is. Mm. The next morning uh, was a Sunday morning, and we went to church as normal. And afterwards, Hillary, um, Hillary looked at me, and she said, I don't think this is it. And I said, I don't think so either. She said, what? Wow. <laughs> you know, the world? never thought Tanner Johnsford would say that. Mm. Um, you know, because for years I had been trying to say, okay, well, you know, maybe – uh, maybe all these things that sound like works righteousness are just sanctification or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but we both knew at that moment, okay, uh, we're done. And our lives are never going to be the same. We drove home and um, I said, okay, I need to go for a walk. And it was, it was a beautiful peak fall foliage day. And I uh, went for a walk and I said, okay, <laughs> I could never atone for all of my sin. There's just no way. Um, I repent of my sin. I repent of Christian science. It is only through Christ's righteousness um, that I could ever have atonement with God. Yeah. And... That's it. I was free. Oh my goodness. T- Tanner, Tanner, how, how did it feel to look at the world after that and say, look, this is not an illusion. This is actually a creation of God to actually look at nature and see the beauty of God's design. How, how did that feel? It's well, gotta be I mean, totally it was, different. It was, it, it, absolutely different. And it was, uh, you know, like I said, it was peak fall foliage. It was just such a beautiful day. And, and you're, just, and just you're now, too... and you're now allowed to feel right. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. my goodness. That's beautiful, dude. Yeah. So I came back home and I said to my wife, we've got to get to a real church tonight. And so we Googled for a PCA church with an evening service. Um, yeah, we're Presbyterians. It's all right. <laughs> it's okay. We're all works in progress. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, and, uh, um, and, uh, we, we thought it, a church with an evening service. And, and, and for years, um, 
uh, I had been I had been reader at one of the largest churches in the world, which is there in St. Louis, mm-hmm. and um, <laughs> and would drive past uh, reformed churches on the way there, and my heart was just like I want to be able to go to those churches. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, for years have been uh, uh, feeling that we didn't know any Christians. We didn't even we weren't even sure how to go about. <laughs> meeting Christians. Um, so, so we got to, um, to the church and it was an ordination service and they had had the wrong time on the website because the ordination service started earlier. And so we walked in, in the middle of, of the service. Um, and my wife took the kids down to, uh, to the, uh, nursery and I'm just out in the lobby and I'm, I'm, I'm weeping. Hmm. And, uh, and someone, uh, the, an usher came up to me and, and, you know, tried to comfort me, asked me what was going on. And I told him just a, just a snippet of my story and his parents had come out of Christian science. <laughs> no way. And, and, and I looked at, um, and it was an ordination service and the preacher was preaching and it happened to be Ligon Duncan, the <laughs> chancellor of reformed theological seminary who I'd listened to preach for years. Um, and he, after the service, they ran and they grabbed him and he came up to me and, and um, I told him my story. He was the first one to pray for us as new Christians. Um, and they went and they grabbed somebody um, who was uh, working with the children was a girl that I went to high school with 20 years before who is the founder and director of the only ministry in the world for former Christian scientists. What? Yeah. (laughs) God is amazing. Keep going, brother. Yeah. And, and, and she said, Tanner, what are you doing here? Cause she knew I was a practitioner and she said, you know, aren't you a practitioner? And I said, not anymore. And she said, well, as of when? And I said, this afternoon, um, and, you know, I told her some of the story and just said, look, I just wanted to serve the real God, or I just wanted to serve God. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm just weeping. And she said, now you can serve him for real. Wow. Um, so um, that night we called our Christian science teacher and um, <laughs> told him we were leaving Christian science. Um, and he said that, um, and we had a, like an hour long conversation and, and, and he said, uh, well, yeah, Mary Baker, he didn't get it from the Bible. It was a, it was a revelation to her, which the Bible, you know, confirms her revelation. And that's just not what I had thought he'd been teaching for the last 20 years. Yeah. It's always um, a private revelation. Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the next day we told our friends and our family and, we told the um, uh, told the church that we were not going to be practitioners anymore, and um, ended up with um, <laughs> uh, um, they wanted to to try to help us some you know somehow you know I thought maybe oh okay maybe you're having some sort of financial issue or something like that and he said no 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 we're leaving Christian Science. And um, both my wife and, and myself had an opportunity to, um, to preach the gospel to the heads of the church. Praise God. Mm. And um, several of, our, uh, of my friends said this was the biggest earthquake to hit the church in decades. And, uh, and it was like setting off a nuclear bomb. Mm. Um, we had been sharing the message of the gospel with our friends and family. I was talking to people every single day about justification and sanctification and, and, and the blood of Christ. And people just loved it. They were hearing the message of a God who knew them and loved them for the first time. And they loved what they were hearing. And then when we converted, every single one of those doors closed. Mm. Um, and um, those people don't want to ever talk with me again. Wow. Um, I'm just praying that we had an opportunity to plant and somebody else will come along and water. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I have no idea how many tears, uh, my wife and I have shed hmm. over the last year and a half for, 
for all of our friends and family, so many, um, so many hundreds of people that we know, thousands of people, um, that, um, that we know and, and, and worked with and, and, you know, shared lives with, um, and, um, you know, that's been very hard. The loss of all of those friendships, um, and friendships with people who were tracking every single thing that we were saying. Um, um, they're not going to be brought out of Christian science through human power. It's only through the work of the Holy spirit. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to be brought out of Christian science by just trying to poke holes in, in, in Christian science. There are lots of holes that can be, that can be poked. Um, but there's a there's a great old sermon by a, um, a man named Thomas Chal- Thomas Chalmers who talked about the ex- the ex- um, explosive explosive power of a new affection. Mm. And basically, our old narrative of Christian Science or whatever the cult may be has to be replaced by the new narrative Amen. of God's love for us in Christ. Yeah, and and so as you are as you are talking to, you know, maybe a Christian scientist, you know, or a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon, just pointing out, you know, different historical things and little gotchas here and there. You know, I, I knew all of those and, and, and I could refute all of those to my own satisfaction and, and did for 20 years, you know, and defending Christian science in the Wall Street Journal and Boston Globe. But when the message of the gospel hit my heart, that transformed it and and so to present the message of the gospel of a god who knows us and loves us and redeems us through his <laughs> through his son um that is powerful and that is that brings about marvelous transformation and it has for me and my wife and 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 for uh, for scores of other people, um, hundreds of others, and you know, I just I just pray that that God will continue to do a great work, mm. and uh, and will um, bring Christians in, into their lives and, um, and and help present the gospel. Uh, uh, to them, because this is a message which resonates deeply in the heart, and this is a message that people want to hear. And um, yeah, it it it's not easy, but you know, to to the Christians out there who are, who are listening, you don't have to be an expert on Christian science, but you <laughs> you're an expert on the gospel. Yeah, um, you know your Lord who, who has saved you and who has redeemed you. And you don't need to be able to poke holes in Christian science, but just to boldly and humbly and lovingly proclaim who the Lord is for you, um, what he can do for them. Um, that, that changes hearts and, um, and I just pray that that it will uh, bring about a a uh, transformation. God, look, God is going to bring every single one of His people to Himself. Yep. He cannot fail. And um, yeah, I just uh, encourage everyone listening to pray with me that uh, that He would do so. Um, you know, I hope people come away from from these podcasts not with a sense of wow, that's a really wacky call, but with a, a conviction to love their Christian science neighbors, love their prosperity gospel neighbors, mm-hmm. love their <laughs> Mormon neighbors, and, uh, and to bring them the only message that heals. And um, my wife and I have experienced so much healing, so much transformation in the last year and a half. It's just remarkable. And, um, we just, um, you know, we so long to see that for all of our friends and family. Wow. Well, Tanner, um, I, I, I think 
I don't think you could, we could wrap it up any better than the way you just ended it. And that, that is just so, it's so good. And I really appreciate you saying that too, because a lot of people are, are fascinated by, uh, you know, Mary Baker Eddy and just like a lot of the, there's definitely a lot of cultish and friends as, aspects of it. And, that, and obviously the aspect of not going to the hospital and all the things that entail with that. But at, at the end of the day, we, like I said, we're not neutral here. We, we have, we have the truth that God has revealed his, the historical God's revelation revealed through objective history. And here we, and here we have it. So we're, we can't be neutral in regards to this. Neutrality is a myth. Um, and like I said, unless you begin with an objective standard, you don't have any measurement yet. don't have any, any way to measure uh, what it is. So um, I, I really appreciate you again, man, just coming on. I, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just blown away. You know, I just think about what, you had to suppress like for so long and it kind of goes along with what the Bible says in Romans about, about suppressing the truth and unrighteousness, mm-hmm. you know, but it's the righteousness of God that comes through faith. And, you know, it really kind of captivated me, you know, and I, and I appreciate you be, again, you just being transparent, you know, and it's like, and even like we, your emotion stuff and that's okay. And in a sense, you know, you're probably given all your upbringing in it, you know, you're, making up for lost time in a sense, you know, and, and I say that just, just, you know, ob- observing that and that's an okay and beautiful thing. Um, but, but yeah, man, it's just been, uh, I don't know. I feel like I'm just at a, I'm just, bl- I'm just blown away, but it's just knowing that. Yeah. So the God, yeah, what I was saying is that the, uh, the gospel though, is that it's not just that you have your sins forgiven or that you get the righteousness of God. I mean, that's a means to an end is that you get God. And you get exactly. his love, which is the love that is the triune love between Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit that was shared with God before the foundation of the world. So um, I think we have a train. Just so you know, too, we have like a train right behind our studio. So sometimes <laughs> if you hear that mumbling, that's what it is if you guys end up hearing that. But it's all good. Um, we'll wrap up things up here. We've been here for a while. Andrew, any last words before we wrap up? No, I just want to echo what our brother Tanner was saying is that yeah, there may be these fringe things. There's there's things that may be interesting to talk about, but the truth is, and the reason why we're here is because there are people being hurt from these cults and believing in a false Christ, a Christ that can't save. And that that that's why we should be here. That's why we should be discussing this, is to get the gospel in there because the gospel is the power of God for salvation. Yep. That That's it. It's as simple as that. And we need to remember that there's people out there that we should be caring about and loving. And the, the truth is that love, love is preaching them the gospel, getting over yourself, leveling with them on the, on a, on the playing field, which is we're all sinners in need of a holy God uh-huh. and saying, this is what God did for me. And I'm going to preach to you the gospel because I love you no matter how uncomfortable it is. And that that's, that's what I was getting out of that Tanner. I love that so much. I loved your, your transparency like Jerry was saying and I, I'm so encouraged brother and I, I, I just can't wait to see what God's going to do with this I just I can't wait alright so uh, thank you guys for listening to this uh, two part series on our kind of introductory episode on Christian science and all things and, and the world of uh, Mary Baker Eddy there's definitely a lot more we could jump to at some point so Tanner uh, thank you again my friend and we will uh, talk to you soon <laughs>